Hey guys, it's Dr. Mitch. I just wanted to focus here on uh, some data I had presented at a talk I gave at Union College that was snark snarky in its title, The Unparalleled Evils of Cannabis. Really, I just want to take a look at health effects here and try to keep in mind some good decisions for drug safety. So as I've mentioned here are uh, a whole bunch of things in the United States that you can own. Uh, you can definitely rent a fighter pilot and drive it if you've got enough money. Um, here we see a rifle that uh, is semi-automatic, but when you're about 12 years old in Missouri, you learn how to take a metal rod and a file and make it fully automatic. Uh, on the bottom left here, I've got uh, basically a laser that you can build based on plans that you can find on the web that can burn through wood. On the lower right here, I've got uh, my friends at driveatank.com where you can rent a tank to drive, although you can't crush other people's cars with it. And in the middle here, there are now, I believe, at least 13 states where you can own a grizzly bear in the Tiger King era. I'm hoping this uh, gets rethought, but nevertheless, we're trusting citizens with a whole bunch of things, and yet we don't trust each other with a green plant. Hey gang, it's Dr. Mitch. I just wanted to get into more of the key issues related to cannabis consumption in this section of my snarky little talk, The Unparalleled Evils of Cannabis. just want to focus on the notion of dependence or substance use problems. So the bottom line is we had definitions of both dependence and abuse for many years under the DSM-4, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and now we've moved to the DSM-5, which no longer makes that distinction. Uh, shout out to my friend Chris Martin, who was on that uh, committee to make that distinction. It dropped some of the more ridiculous symptoms. Unfortunately, may have uh, included some other problematic ones. But back in the day, you could get a diagnosis of cannabis abuse, essentially just by getting busted for possession, which obviously made cannabis uh, abuse look more prevalent and more prevalent among ethnic minorities, as we get into when we talk about joys of prohibition. So we've got a moving target here on the definition. And then I really want to emphasize that even if uh, these percentages are low, it's still a big deal just because we've got so many people in the United States. So let's kind of keep that in mind. I wanted to focus on um, these data from Hassan, just saying that, look, it looks like uh, definitely use is increasing across years. I don't know if it's actually that uh, folks have just been more willing to say that they use now that uh, legalization has made some progress, but we, we are seeing more frequent use, uh, past year use and past month use and lifetime use. So let's kind of keep this in mind. And then this data set suggests there's an increase in cannabis use disorder um, in the DSM-5 definition, but it's not the same as it was in the DSM-4. And then uh, my friend Rick Grusha, other people are saying actually there aren't meaningful changes. So let's get into the, the notion. The bottom line is we really need to talk about well, what do we mean by a substance use? So yeah, so these are the most common symptoms, at least back in the DSM-4 days, were tolerance, time loss, and withdrawal. And I'm a little critical of the tolerance thing because we've got to think about, well, why is tolerance a symptom of problems? Now, for alcohol, it's obvious. You've got to expose your liver to more and more of the same substance in order to get the same subjective effects in a day. That's really going to be problematic. With cannabis, we don't have a lethal dose. It's maybe if you generalize from the animal data, two pounds. And as my undergraduates would say, if you've got two pounds and you smoke it all yourself, you deserve to die. But bottom line is it's not as if there are uh, big toxic effects of THC that are easily detectable. So I don't want to exaggerate tolerance relative to some of these other uh, symptoms for, for other drugs. The time loss, again, this is uh, clearly a problem if you've been high when you weren't supposed to be high and then you didn't have a productive time. But if you basically had to spend an hour trying to find cannabis when uh, your neighbor who's 
you've got an alcohol problem, can get it around the corner. I'm not sure if that's a fair comparison. And then the notions of withdrawal, as I mentioned, that eager to get a better feel for how cannabis withdrawal is documented and how it works. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, and I'm sure there are folks who have it. It's just a curious issue to weight it the same as, say, opiate withdrawal, which I'm sure telling some somebody addicted to opiates that you're having cannabis withdrawal is a good way to get kicked in the crotch. Well, so I wanted to take a look at just some uh, problems related to first use from the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And they were just saying, hey, folks who used regularly, how many of them then subsequently developed problems? And you'll notice that cannabis is definitely near the bottom. The hallucinogens are you know, even less likely, um, in part because they're just not used with any kind of frequency. But uh, you know, tobacco and heroin are way, way out there, and tobacco is certainly the most likely to create some kind of negative consequence and key in on some addictive potential. And cannabis is literally about a third of that. And this 9.1% is any problem. So I want to emphasize, too, that substance use disorder, at least uh, related to cannabis directly, looks like is maybe 3% at best of the U.S. We're not sure how it relates to those who uh, have used and then developed problems. So that may be an underestimate. And then it does raise the question, are problems increasing? So Rick Grusha has looked at uh, these big uh, national data sets, and it looks like the results may vary depending upon the source of your data. But he's showing here in these light blue squares, this is the base rate of the diagnosis of problems, and this is the old DSM-4 uh, dependence notion, and it's, you know, always just a little under 2%. So we're not seeing a ton of Americans getting this from a percentage rate. Obviously, if use rates increase with uh, change in prohibition, and we're seeing that's definitely the case, this exact number is going to be a bigger number, and so we want to be mindful of that. And then what do we have here? We've got the triangles are basically, you know, what's the percentage of people uh, using from the whole population. And then as laws have relaxed, we are seeing more folks who've used in the past month. So uh, closing in on 14% of U.S. adults. And then these circles are an intriguing idea. It's what's the rate of substance use problems among folks who used in the past month. And we're actually seeing a drop in that, in the sense that maybe as more people use, the percentage of folks who are problematic users uh, is, is dropping simply because um, folks who didn't use before are either earlier in that addictive process or just, you know, you've got more people using, you've got more folks who can, who can handle it who also use. What do we make of this? Well, I don't want to... Uh, sound alarmist, and I don't want to say everything is fine. Having 2% of your population struggle with cannabis is always a bummer, but I don't want to pretend like this is the same as being an alcoholic or uh, being addicted to some other drugs, so let's keep that in mind when we're interpreting. And then uh, Deb Hassan's data suggests that problems really have increased over the years, but again, we're talking about maxing out around 3% of the folks who fit the old DSM-4 diagnosis. I feel like some of this may be self-report bias in the sense that, hey, uh, now that cannabis laws are changing, folks are just more willing to fess up to having used. And these, uh, some of these interviews are done face-to-face, -face, so it's you know obviously a, uh, a lot of demand characteristics. And then these changing definitions of problems may be contributing as well. So now that we've gotten rid of that ridiculous legal symptom, for example, I'm hoping uh, some of these things are, are going to drop. What are some of the professional impressions of dependence risk? I uh, did a fun chapter with uh, Bob Gore, who's a splendid PhD student from my USC days, and who's actually working on some quantitative 
a PhD as well. Anybody who wants two PhDs, I tip their, my hat to. But we basically just asked over 700 mental health professionals, hey, how addictive are these things? And as you can see, uh, cannabis is above the hallucinogens, LSD, and MDMA, but significantly lower than everything else, including caffeine. Uh, when we first sent in this manuscript, I wanted to call it marijuana almost as addictive as caffeine. Um, and I was doing the edited book, but at Oxford they were a little disheartened by that title, so I changed it. David Nutt, years later, had a paper in some really prestigious journal basically doing this exact same thing. He's David Nutt, so he gets to publish it somewhere big. And, you know, obviously cannabis is just not something that mental health professionals perceive as anywhere near as dependence producing as some of these other drugs, including legal drugs. I didn't even get tobacco on this list because it's above cocaine. Uh, it's above with heroin as well. And then I just wanted to bring up a point about uh, the combination of cannabis and alcohol. And the bottom line here is that the rates of dependence symptoms tend to increase with use of cannabis. So this is the high per week variable, just uh, how high do you get on your usual use and how many times do you use? Do you use? Um, but the bottom line here is as people drink more alcohol, the link between use and problems increases. And they really do have this main effect where folks who drink alcohol, who uh, essentially smoke the same amount, end up with more problems. Either there's a me metabolic issue here or a problem with the self-report. So yes, alcohol does slow metabolism of a number of drugs, including cannabis. Maybe folks who are using cannabis in conjunction with alcohol, the THC is metabolized more slowly, and we do have lab data supporting that, but also that maybe they're just misattributing some of these symptoms. So if I say, hey, are you craving and craving alcohol? Is that a distinct craving from craving for cannabis, um, I'm a little skeptical, we'll, we'll have to see. And then some of the other symptoms as well. So if you uh, used cannabis and alcohol one night and then messed up on the job, which one gets the fault is, isn't necessarily clear. So I think uh, in some ways we need to just think about these as substance use problems rather than trying to spearhead, oh, this one's the bad one and this one's the good one. Like, you know a good life when you see it. Well, so how can we avoid problems? Again, I want to emphasize a number of themes that are bound to help you decrease problematic use, increasing drug safety. First and foremost, less is more. All right. If you're accustomed to smoking a certain amount, it gets to be kind of a reflex. Truth be told, pay attention to how you are feeling about it and what a surprise the amount you will use decreases. That's connected to my other recommendation here, avoid automaticity. You know those folks who have that robotic Friday night must get high you know, reaction. And obviously, no, just because it's Friday night doesn't mean you must get high. And make a conscious decision. Is this going to be something you're going to enjoy or is this just something you're doing without any thought? Definitely vaporize. So the respiratory irritation and then use in response uh, even though you have those problems, is, is a sign of troubled use. Please invest in the vaporizer. Savor with friends. And here I'm going to emphasize, we've got two studies now showing that uh, savoring, just the tendency to relish positive experiences more generally, and I would say savoring your cannabis experience. So talking about, hey, how does this feel? How does it relate to other uh, experiences with cannabis? What do I think of this uh, dosage, etc.? you're more likely to be attentive. You're mindful of the effect. Odds are high you're going to have a lower quantity consumed on that incident. And then with your friends around, I feel like this is another way to buffer against those social support issues. So folks who are saying they've got social impairments, in part, they're just not reaching out. If you're getting high by yourself all the time and not hanging out with anybody, maybe that's in some ways the source of that problematic symptom. Don't wake and bake. Uh, my lab published a paper on this. I just love having a title, Don't Wake and Bake. It was in addiction research and theory. And basically showed that, yeah, the earlier you start in your day, 
the more likely you are to report some of these other symptoms. So, you know, get the job done. Uh, if you're a medical user, use the lowest dose you can in order to alleviate symptoms, but experiment with how much you need and how early you need it. And I think you'll be delighted at, uh, if nothing else, a smaller cannabis bill. And then grow up first. So not only is the timing in your day, but the timing in your life. And truth be told, based on Stacy Gruber's data, I hate to sound like an old dude, but like waiting till you're 24 and your frontal lobe is completely developed before you have any exposure to any psychoactive is a defensible position. But surely don't use before you have your high school diploma and uh, you'll be stunned to learn there's a chance that you'd uh, be markedly less likely to develop any problems. Well, I appreciate you guys tuning in, and this is a nice thing to focus on cannabis and substance use problems, and we'll pick it up from here. Thanks so much.